What do a horse, a ship, Smokey the Bear, and a grapevine have in common? They're all used by the book of James to describe the power, the danger, and the hypocrisy of the tongue. Okay, so James didn't specifically mention Smokey the Bear, but, but there is a connection, and we'll get there in a little bit. But before we go on to study the tongue here in the book of James, I just want to remind us that the book of James, as we read it, isn't, first of all, to teach us how to be a good person. Yes, it does teach all kinds of, all kinds of ways that we are to serve God, and, and yes, it points out all kinds of ways that we fail. And so in that sense, it teaches us how to be good people. But that's not where we should start. What we need to realize is that, first of all, the book of James shows us that we are not good people. It shows us that we are bad people. And so it shows us the many ways that we are bad. And it does so for the purpose that then we're reminded of how desperately we need a Savior because we can't save ourselves. And so every time it shows us our sin, it's pointing us to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you now as we look at the tongue uh, to have that attitude of self-reflection today. And not, not being defensive and saying, oh, I'm not that bad, or I'm not as bad as that person over there. H have you seen the potty mouth they have? No, instead I invite you to ask God to convict you of your sin and show you how you use your tongue in ways th that do not honor and glorify him. Let God expose the sins of your mouth today. And I think verse 2 of our text it helps us with that attitude a little bit. James 3 verse 2 says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Uh, the point being made there is none of us are perfect in this area. All of us fail to control our tongues as we should. And so let, let's let God show us the ways we are failing here. One of the challenges maybe to taking the tongue seriously enough is the culture that we live in. We live in a culture that doesn't take words very seriously. You see people all the time in the media spouting off and just speaking carelessly. We see our government leaders doing the same thing. Many people in our world would do well to think a bit more before they speak. But then we also see the response once they've said these words. Uh, oftentimes they'll say, well, I didn't quite mean that. Or, you know, I just said those words, but that's not who I am. And so they kind of separate the words they say from the people they are. And as we kind of take this in from our culture, it, it's easy for us as Christians to think of sins of the tongue as kind of the small sins, the ones that don't matter that much. But that's really not how our text describes those sins today. It, it describes sins of the tongue, of the mouth, as very serious. And so James here gives a vivid description of the power, the danger, and the hypocrisy of the tongue. So first, let's look at how he describes the power of the tongue. But before we really dive in there, I, I want to just say it's interesting how this chapter starts. He, it's a chapter generally about the tongue and the danger of the tongue. But he starts out with a warning to teachers. Verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now that verse applies especially to me as a pastor, realizing that in the New Testament there seems to be a position of teacher the position of pastor. And so that's a warning for me that I need to take seriously. But then it also applies to others within our congregation who are teaching. We're blessed with several men in our church who are willing to fill a pulpit and preach while I'm gone. It would apply to them. We have Sunday school teachers who are teaching our children and sometimes our adults. It would apply to those teachers. 
or to our Bible study leaders. And we need to recognize as those who teach God's word that for us our tongues are uniquely powerful and can be uniquely dangerous because we have the potential to lead the people listening to us astray, to teach them wrongly. And so it's important as we teach to prepare that we don't take this responsibility lightly, that we don't kind of wait for God to just drop a message into our head, or that we don't read a verse and just tell people how it makes us feel. And no, we're called to study God's word deeply, and to, make, to do our best to understand it well so that then we can accurately teach it to other people. But then also we should be reminded that we're not going to say everything perfectly. And so we can trust God and his grace uh, to forgive us when we fail as teachers too. And we can trust that God uses us oftentimes in spite of the words that we speak. So now continuing, James gives two examples of things that are small but powerful. The first example he gives is a horse bit. It's this little piece of metal that you stick in a horse's mouth. And, but with that bit, you're able to control this large animal and steer it the directions that you want it to go. The other example he gives is a ship. Uh, that you can have an enormous ship, but the way you steer that ship is with a small rudder. That as you turn that rudder, then it turns the ship. So he's explaining how the tongue is a small part of the body, but it's extremely powerful. Proverbs 18.1, it describes the power of the tongue. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. And so there it talks about the positive power of the tongue, that life is in the, is in the tongue, but then also the destructive power, that death is in the power of the tongue. And as this text in James continues, he focuses on the destructive power of the tongue, the danger of the tongue. And now this is where Smokey the Bear comes in. Smokey the Bear was created basically as a public relations, a public relations, what would you call him, a mascot? But to remind people to be careful with how they treat their fires realizing that a small fire, whether it's a cigarette butt or whether it's a campfire, it can lead to a huge forest fire. And so Smokey the Bear says what? Only you can prevent forest fires. It's a reminder to take the power of small flames seriously. And James here uses the illustration of a small fire and how it can start a forest fire talking about how dangerous the tongue is. And then he describes it as staining the whole body and setting on fire the entire course of life. And if we think in our own lives, both of what we've seen personally from ourselves and what we've seen in other people's lives, well, we can think of many ways that the tongue is extremely destructive, that it sets a forest on fire. The tongue hurts and destroys friendships. It destroys family relationships. We've seen the tongue destroy marriages. The tongue can impact a child's entire life. Some of you here today think that you're bad singers because one person when you were young told you that you couldn't sing. And there's children who believe that they'll never amount to anything because that's what they were told as a child. Our tongue can lead other people to sin when we suck them into sinful behaviors that we're involved with. Our tongue can wound those people that we love. Uh, oftentimes you hear the illustration of a toothpaste bottle. That's easy to get the toothpaste out, but it's awfully tough to get it back in. And that's how our words are. That as you say something, oftentimes you'd like to take it back, but the damage is done. There's no stuffing it back. And so James continues and he says that wild animals can be tamed. There's all kinds of different animals that we've managed to tame. But no one can tame the tongue. He says it's a restless evil full of poison. I'd like you to think for a moment, where does most of your sinning happen? 
probably for many of us, most of our sinning happens when we open our mouths, right? And so James has d- generally described the power and the danger of the tongue. But let's just take a moment uh, to think about some of the specific sins of the tongue, some of the specific ways that we dishonor God with our tongue. There's some of the obvious ones like lying and saying things that aren't true. And not just the big lies, but those little lies we say that so that we don't hurt someone's feelings. That's the destructive power of the tongue. Or bragging, building yourself up. That criticizing other people. Interrupting other people because you don't care enough to hear what they have to say. There's manipulating. Using your words just to get out of other people what you want. There's the ways we express anger with our tongue. Or there's being defensive. Instead of admitting when we're wrong, we use our words to explain away our sin. And of course there's cursing, which we know the bad words that you shouldn't say, swearing, but also using God's name in vain. Using God's name carelessly. Or gossip. And I'm, I think this is one of those sins that we don't take seriously enough in the church. But using our tongues to, to talk about other people in a way that really doesn't help them, in a way that doesn't love them. A- and often in a way that makes us feel better about ourselves. A- and oftentimes we just say, oh, I'm just sharing information. <laughs> or maybe I'm sharing a prayer request. Uh, but gossip is something we need to take seriously. And I'd encourage you this week even to take time to think, is what I'm saying to this other person, is that gossip? And you may be surprised how often you could say, yeah, it probably is. James also describes the tongue as set on fire by hell. And it might be helpful for us to think, where are your words coming from? Are they coming from heaven? Are they building people up? Are they encouraging them? Are they being used for God's glory? Or are they coming from hell? Are they discouraging and tearing down and causing division? Uh, Another verse that convicts me is Ephesians 4, verse 29. And, And I'm going to read from the New American Standard Version because I think it expresses it clearly. It says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And that speaks to those careless words we say without thinking much, doesn't it? Is this really benefiting anyone? But I do want to point out one thing, because I think we as Midwesterners need to hear this. Those guys on the coast, they tend to be a bit more direct. They just say what they think. But not us nice Midwesterners. We'll be really nice to someone's face, and then we'll go talk about them behind their back. And this can be a problem often in the church. That we, instead of addressing an issue that needs to be dealt with, we just go talk about it with other people. Uh, I'll I'll use Dr. Dahl as an example because he's not here. (laughs) No, but Dr. Dahl is the president of our congregation, right? But how often does someone have a concern with what's going on in our church and go directly to him uh, to talk about it? More often people have a concern with how he has handled something or I've handled something or whatever leader it might be. And then you go talk to someone else about that and say, can you believe how Dr. Dahl is ruining our church? Can you believe that he handled it this way? And then that person can go talk to someone else and soon there's this whole movement and Dr. Dahl has never even heard of anything. And I don't know that there's any major issues like that going on now, but it, it really is kind of typical of how churches in general handle things. And so when we talk about using our words according to the need of the moment, sometimes the need of the moment is to be direct and address issues. Or maybe in a friend's life, the need of the moment is for you to have that awkward conversation where you mention some sin in their life. So it's not always about being comfortable with our words. Uh, but using them in the way that is needed. I said that most of your sins likely happen between your lips as you open your mouth, uh, but I don't think that's quite accurate. Because, you see, our words don't come out of nowhere. 
that your mouth doesn't magically open and you're like, I had no control of that. Or someone else was controlling my mouth for that moment. Your words are coming out of somewhere. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The words that come out of our mouths really come out of our heart. They reflect what's truly in there. Paul David Tripp is an author, and in his book on parenting, he talks about the way that we talk to our kids or the way we respond to our kids and how oftentimes we'll be impatient and exasperated with them. And we want to blame it on them, say, they're driving me crazy. But he says it's kind of like this. If you have water in your hand and someone comes and hits your hand, the water is going to spill out, right? But the person who hit your hand didn't put the water there. It was already there. They just caused it to be spilled out. And in the same way, when we respond in anger and impatience, the people aren't, ca- aren't creating that anger and impatience. It's already in our hearts. And perhaps the situation then made it spill out and show what was really there. And so the words we say reflect our hearts. When we gossip, it shows that we're wanting to put others down so we feel better. When we brag, it's showing that we think highly of ourselves and less of other people. Or that we're insecure and that we want attention from other people. When we use God's name in vain, it shows that deep down we don't have the reverence and respect for him that we should. So then God in the book of James continues and he describes the hypocrisy of the tongue. A hypocrite saying, uh, being someone who says one thing and does another. Now have you ever heard this? Uh, After someone just swears a blue streak, uh, then someone else responds and says, you kiss your mother with that mouth? Uh, Have you heard that? No one's heard that? I think it's a great phrase. (laughs) But what's the point being made there? It's saying, uh, you're using your wor- your mouth for such ugly things. Uh, and then you go and show love to your mom with that mouth? And that's the point that James is making here. He says, you worship God with the same mouth that you use to curse and to harm other people. And then he gives examples of how that doesn't work. It's inconsistent. He says, for example, when you see a spring of water coming out of the ground... It's not going to have both fresh water and salt water coming out of it. And actually, if you think about it, if it is mixed, it's just all salt water, isn't it? Or with a grapevine, it's not going to all of a sudden start producing figs. And so in the same way, it's inconsistent for us to use our mouths to hurt other people and be living for Christ. It's inconsistent. It doesn't go together. And he, can, he says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. That should not characterize us as believers in Christ. So as we conclude our message today, I just want to kind of give a brief history of words as we find it in Scripture. And we see the power of words from the very beginning, the power of God's word specifically. That God spoke the world into existence. But then Satan used words to deceive the first people, Adam and Eve. And after Satan had deceived them and talked them into disobeying God, then Adam and Eve used their words to blame someone else. Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent. And from that point, when they disobeyed God, humanity has been unable to tame our tongues. But right after that, God used words to promise that a Savior would one day come. And then he continued to make that promise over and over again in the Old Testament. And then we get to the New Testament, when that promise is fulfilled. And the book of John describes this is, this is where it gets cool. The book of John describes Jesus as the Word of God. And it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And that word, Jesus Christ, never spoke a sinful word. And sometimes I think we kind of say, yeah, and yeah, I know Jesus was perfect. But think of all the careless words you say. And yet Jesus never spoke a careless word. He never said a word that wasn't beneficial for the people who heard him. He always spoke according to the need of the moment. Going back to that verse 2 in James 3, where it says, And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Jesus was that perfect man who never stumbled in what he said. And yet he was crucified on a Roman cross. And as he died, all of your sinful words, every careless word you have spoken, every careless word that anyone throughout history has ever spoken was placed on him. And he paid for those sins. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again, and shortly after he came back to life, he commanded his disciples to go spread the salvation that he had won for us at the cross. And how were the disciples supposed to spread that salvation? Through the word of God. And so as the word of God spread, people believed in Christ, and they were saved from their sins. And God's word today continues to give life to people who are dead in their sin. And it continues to save people as it works faith in their hearts. And then as people do believe in Christ, they confess with their mouth, as Romans says, they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. God's word restores as it brings people, instead of destroying like our words do, God's word restores as it brings people into a right relationship with the one who made them. And it continues to restore, for those of us who know Jesus, it continues to restore and transform our ugly hearts. And so as God changes our ugly hearts through his word, then also the words that come out of our mouth are also transformed. And so instead of speaking words of destruction and death that come out of our ugly hearts, as God changes our hearts, we begin, to, we begin to speak words of life, words that encourage and words that build up, words that tell the message of what Christ did for us. We speak words that restore, words that redeem situations, that bring good out of bad. We speak words that honor and worship God. We speak words that edify according to the need of the moment and words that give grace to those who hear. And so as the power of the word of God continues to work in us, more and more that should be reflected in the words that we speak. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, I thank you for the time to focus on the tongue. And Lord, honestly, we don't focus on it enough. We don't take the words we say seriously enough. And Lord, we confess to you that we fail often in this area, that we often speak carelessly, that we speak in ways that do not honor you, and we speak in ways that hurt those people around us. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us for the sake of Christ who never did speak a sinful word. And Lord, as James says here, no human is able to tame the tongue. And so we confess to you that we are unable to tame our own tongues. And so we need you to do that. And so, Lord, please continue to transform and change our hearts so that our words may also be transformed. Amen.